Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Today we're going to um, use this uh, En-ROADS uh, climate model to explore solutions in, in climate change. And so this is an interactive workshop, so I want all of you to be prepared to uh, answer questions and, and, and be involved in discussions. So first, um, uh, the En-ROADS model, En-ROADS stands for um, Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support Model. Um, this was uh, developed by a nonprofit called Climate Interactive in collaboration with MIT's management, uh, MIT Management Sustainability Initiative. Um, and they are constantly um, updating the model um, so to include the, the best science that available. Um, so we're going to just have an introduction to, uh, to climate science, and then we're going to talk about these scenarios of, of, of climate success and then move on to a debrief about how, how it went. So let's take a brief review of the science of what's at stake. So look at this graph here. This is the atmospheric carbon dioxide over the last 800,000 years. And just to orient the graph, um, here is the present here, um, zero, and zero is, um, is, is uh, at 1950. And then this is years before the present going back. So from 800,000 years ago to the present. And then this uh, is the concentration of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million. And as you can see that over the geologic period, over the last 800,000 years, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has ranged from a low of about 180 parts per million to a high of about 300 parts per million. And it has never exceeded 300 parts per million until around 1950, right about here. And then this is our current level as of 2019. We are now currently this year at about 417 parts per million. So you can see that this, uh, this values are far exceed what we've seen in the geologic record. So let's look at where the carbon dioxide has, has come from. These are uh, the emissions by source starting from 1950 here to 2018. And so this is in um, the CO2 emissions in gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And you'll see starting in 1950, uh, 1850, the land use was the most, the largest um, input of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere with coal starting to have an impact. And you can see this wedge continues to grow through the 1900s, 1950s, up to 2000 and still continuing to, to grow and it's leveling off a little bit. Oil started um, uh, back in the 1900, and around 1900, but was really not really significant and still started growing in about 1950, becoming um, a, a bigger, bigger component of our emissions of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Gas, natural gas started a bit later than that, um, but has continued to grow over time. And then these other gases or emissions from cement production and gas uh, flaring um, here have, have, has grown to some extent. Land use changes has gone up and down a bit, but probably is a little bit less than it was in about 1850. So these are carbon dioxide emissions, um, but let's look at all of the different greenhouse gases. So the uh, carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels, this is the uh, information that was on the previous graph. Again, from about 1850 was rather, really small and has grown to be um, um, on almost uh, about you know, 36 or 37 gigatons of carbon, of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Um, and then we have carbon dioxide from land use and forestry. It's a small percent, per, a 7% of the uh, total greenhouse gas emissions. Methane, which is mostly from agricultural um, and agricultural um, activities and from industry, is about 18%. And nitrous oxide uh, is uh, nitrous oxide is about five percent, and the F gases or those are the man-made chlorofluorocarbonated gases um, is about two percent of all of the greenhouse gas emissions. So, what's the impact of this on the global temperatures from pre-industrial times from about 1850? 
So this is actually, uh, this is observational uh, data. Um, they are temperature anomalies so that they are, all of the values of temperatures are subtracted from an average, I believe from um, 1950 to 1980, well, actually, I guess it's the, it's the temperature anomalies are from the beginning of this record from 1850, because you see that's where it's, it's uh, clustered, around, uh, clustered around zero. There are two different groups here. Uh, this one here, the yellow line is from the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in the United States, which has put together the record from all the records that it's been able to gather around the world. And this one is from the Hadley Meteorological Center in the UK. So the two independently produced records, observational records of the global temperature change from pre-industrial levels show that the increase has been on the order of one degree Celsius or 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since about 1850. So what we're, this is a, this is a basically a screenshot of the temperature change that we're going to be looking at in the model. Um, the baseline is the black line here and the current scenario, and since we have our current scenario is the baseline, um, they coincide at this point. But you can see that um, the projections are for the temperature to increase above pre-industrial levels by 3.6 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. But based um, on uh, what the goals were set at the Paris Agreement in 2015, we want to get this, so we want to implement solutions such that this 3.6 degrees Celsius is brought down to 2.0. So that's this top red dotted line here to the uh, climate goal of 2.0 degrees C with um, uh, striving to get it down to no more than 1.5 degrees C. And so that's the second red, uh, red dotted line here. So let's just think about what it would mean if we actually have a three degrees, it's three degrees C in, it, uh, increase in temperatures. It's, it it uh, is really a very dire situation. Um, Arctic sea ice would be gone two out of every three summers. Some of you may have heard that we've had basically at the, at the end of the summers, they um, mark the extent of the Arctic sea ice. And we've been hitting a new minimum records um, over the past five or six years. Um, another projection is that 50% of insect species um, will lose 50% of their habitat range. And, um, Insects are really important for pollinization for um, and agricultural purposes. Droughts, we've been seeing that there have been many more droughts. The droughts will be 11 months longer, an increase in the average length of drought. And then areas burned by summer wildfires, it says in the Mediterranean, it will double compared to today. But we've seen also that there are wildfires, extensive wildfires in the Western part of the United States and wildfires um, uh, last year in Australia that far exceeded anything that they had had in the past. So let's look at what this means for particular locations. So this is a map of, of uh, Shanghai and China today um, with the ocean out here and, and this is the land area. With a three degrees C warming, you, the, you can see the uh, devastating effect of sea level rise on Shanghai putting most of the city completely underwater. Um, this is New York City today. Um, and if we have, a, I think it was a three and a half degrees in, see increase, um, you can see that all of these areas will be underwater. And I wanted to point out in particular this area right here, uh, because in the next slide, we're going to look at that. This is where Wall Street is. So this is Wall Street today, or today minus COVID. Um, because uh, there's not that many people there um, these days. Um, and this is with a, th with a four degrees of warming, uh, the is sea level rise will completely put Wall Street underwater as indicated on that map, but this is what it looks like on the ground. So London with a four degree sea of warming, um, this is P Parliament, this is the Thames River, and this is the West Westminster Bridge. So the ends of the Westminster Bridge are underwater and the entire lower levels of, of Parliament are underwater. So climate related disasters have cost the world $650 billion just between 2016 and 18. And damages associated with global warming 
could total over $54 trillion by the time we reach uh, uh, 1.5 degrees C increase in warming. Remember, we are already at one degree increase, the degree C increase in warming. So let's think about, let's begin to think about scenarios of success. How will we move forward um, uh, and, and, and address these ca catastrophic potential situations? Well, we're going to be using this model, this En-ROADS uh, 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 um, uh, decision support model. And just to give you an extent, uh, uh, an idea of how extensively this has now been used, we will be adding to this list. There have been up to now uh, 1,636 events in 67 countries, and we've had close to 40,000 participants around the world. This is a screenshot of what the model looks like. It's a cutting edge simulation model to use to test climate solution scenarios. And we're going to be getting into this in depth. So En-ROADS is powered by the best available research on climate science and solutions. It's transparent. All of the equations in the model are open source. So if you go to the website, you can look at all the models. You can actually change the basic assumptions in the models and run it in different, um, in different way, in, in, with uh, different background assumptions. It's, um, and, and it's also fast so that you'll see that it happens in real time. So this is different from climate research models. Climate research models are looking to understand the science behind climate changes. The En-ROADS decision support model simulates what those more complex models uh, uh, do. It cannot be used to study the science. This is simulating the science. It's, this is a, to be an aid in making, in making decisions. So it, you, in, this, in this picture here, you'll see that there is a whole lot of options here on the bottom. And um, we gave you a link to, the, um, uh, to where the documents are um, that uh, provide you with the En-ROADS control panel. And I'll show you that in a second. But these are all the different levers that you can potentially use. And this is the control panel. So uh, you, you, you can um, download this and take a look at it while we're working on this. But for this, in the center section here is all of those levers that I was talking about. And then each one of these um, bubbles up here uh, indicates what this actually means. So for coal, it means you're encouraging, you're discouraging or encouraging the mining of coal and the burning of it for power in power plants. Um, if you go over here, energy transport efficiency. That's this one here. This is transport energy efficiency. This one is increase or decrease the energy efficiency of vehicles, shipping, air travel, and transportation systems. And then you have the electrification. You have the same kind of thing, energy efficiency for the buildings and industry and electrification of buildings and industry. So this gives you an idea of the buildings and industry electrification, increase or decrease in the use of electricity in buildings, appliances, motors, and other machines. We also have levers here for growth. Population growth is assuming a higher or a lower population growth. Economic growth is assuming a higher or lower um, growth in the goods produced and services provided by society. Um, and then you go over here to land and industry emissions. And so here's, so most of these are all uh, carbon dioxide related. But over here, you'll have the other uh, greenhouse gases, methane and other gases that you can you could uh, change uh, their, um, their impact. Um, you have uh, deforestation, de de discouraging deforestation, and afforestation, or encouraging the planting of, of, of more, um, uh, more forests. Um, and then there are technological, the, the, there's the option to technologically remove carbon from the atmosphere pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with new technologies that enhance natural removals or manually sequester and store carbon. Another one I wanted to point out is this new zero carbon. Um, this is on the energy supply side. So this is basically a new technology that we can't imagine now, but sometime before 2100, a new technology is discovered that produces energy with zero carbon footprint. And so that's what, th that's what this lever is here. So we, can set a time for when we think a new technology will, will be, be discovered and, and, and ramp up to be scalable to be used by society. Okay, so we're gonna go to the En-ROADS model now. 
And I want you to think about what act actions you think you can make to help mitigate climate change. Another point that I wanna make as we go to the model here is that this is a global model. And what that means is that in every solution that we are going to implement, we have to assume the model is set up so that everybody in the world does the same solution. So it's not just a particular city, it's not just a particular country. The calculations here assume everybody in the world is making that um, change. So we're gonna look at this and I'm gonna actually change this graph here. There's lots of different graphs to look at, but I was gonna, I, I prefer this one. Um, so this is a graph of the global sources of primary energy in exajoules per year, it's the amount of energy per year from the year 2000 to 2100. And you can see the brown line here is coal. And if you mouse over that line, you can see what the different values are for the different years. 2017, it was 157 exajoules per year. And as you move out here in 2072, it's projected to be uh, 2233.8 exajoules per year. Um, oil is this red line here gas, the dark blue line, renewable energy is this green line, bioenergy is this pink line, nuclear is this light blue line, and the new zero carbon, is, so that's at zero now because we have not assumed that there's any new, um, uh, any new um, uh, discoveries. Okay, so let's look at what we can do with, the, with this model. We're gonna just look at coal first. Um, so I'm going to move this lever and I'm going to say, we are going to highly tax coal. And you can see the lines change. We went from 3.6 to 3.5 here. And uh, some of these lines change. Now, one of the things you can do is you can replay the change. So I'm gonna click this button here and you'll see that it'll move back and forth between, you'll see the brown line coal comes down, renewable energy goes up and gas and oil go up very, very slightly. And the issue here is that if you're taxing coal but not taxing oil or natural gas, people will move to uh, use, the, uh, use oil and natural gas um, because those aren't being taxed as much. Another change you could make is in increase the price of carbon. So the price of carbon impacts all three of these, coal, oil, and natural gas. And so let's see what happens when we change this one. All right, so you can see that now the temperatures come down um, from 3.5 to 3.0. You can see the changes have started relatively soon, you know, about 2025. Um, now let's look at these lines over here. I'm gonna replay this and it's gonna go between 3.5 and 3.0. And you'll see the large increase in renewable energy and the decrease in oil, coal, and gas. Um, you also see a change, a, 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 a decrease in the, uh, in the bioenergy. So these are just, a, this is just some examples of some of the levers. Now, this is at a very high level. The other things that you can do is look under, basically under the, into more details for each of these. So by clicking these three buttons here, these three dots here, you get more, um, more information. So first of all, one of the, the graph here shows a primary Energy, coal at primary energy de demand. And you can see with all the taxes, both the coal taxes um, and um, we've already implemented the carbon tax, this falls dramatically. But um, the uh, high level lever where we said it was very highly taxed puts a price on coal of $50 a ton. But you can also make other changes such as the reduction, the percent reduction in coal utilization, like if there was some policy change that didn't involve taxes, but a policy change that reduced our, our ability to use coal. Um, and so you can set the year that that uh, reduction starts and, and the year potentially stops. You can also set to stop building new coal infrastructure. So there's lots of other details you can go into here. Um, you, when you get to the second half of this workshop, we will um, uh, you, you're welcome to explore some of those, but what, the other thing that I really will want you to look at in more detail is if, if you look at this little eye here and click on that, you'll get also more information about um, the uh, policies and the uh, taxes on coal. So these are examples of the kinds of things that could happen that would impact the, the tax on coal. 
Um, but the uh, pieces that I'm going to want you to look at in detail are these potential co-benefits of discouraging coal. So a lot of by discouraging coal, um, by taxing coal, you decrease its use, but you don't get rid of the infrastructure that uses coal. So that needs that takes time. That can take on the order of 30 years. But there are co-benefits to reducing uh, coal that um, are immediate, immediate benefits. So reducing air pollution from the burning of a coal burning improves air quality and the health outcomes for the surrounding communities. And less coal mining reduces heavy metal drainage and waste from mine sites, which improves water quality and protect wildlife habitats, biodiversity, and ecosystems. And we have one, I have one graph here I can show you with respect to the, um, it's over here on impacts. We're going to look at um, air quality, air pollution from energy. And you can see that by just putting the tax on coal and, um, and uh, putting a tax on carbon, we have almost in 2022, we have immediate um, benefits in terms of uh, air quality. So while this is not a direct impact on temperature, it is a co-benefit of, um, of, um, of making these, implementing the solutions. The other thing that I want you to consider is these equity considerations. So if you put a high tax on coal, then people who um, are re uh, rely on coal for energy but don't have but are low income communities will struggle um, to uh, to actually pay for the coal and will have worse health health outcomes. So this is another for every one of these levers um, and any one of these solutions. Um, the, you can explore both the potential co-benefits and the equity considerations. Okay, so now I'm going to reset this to our initial. I'm going to reset this to go back to this to our initial. So those were just examples. So now I want you to consider what it is that um, what um, in, what changes might you of all of these the, the, these options here. What kinds of changes would you like to would you like to see implemented? And I would like you to put those in the chat. And I'm, we're going to start implementing changes. Let me try to find the chat for a bit. So can people start putting into the chat um, solutions that they might like to see implemented here? I said that this was an interactive session. So um, reduce fossil fuel use by all types by, uh, by 95%. All right, well, we'll, we'll uh, and coal price, carbon prices, more electrification, carbon tax. All right, I'm gonna implement some of these one at a time. Uh, let's see, um, increase renewable energy production. Let's try increasing renewable energy production. We're just going to go up a little bit here. Um, and we're going to subsidize renewable energies. And I am going to go back to this other graph. Okay, so I've, we've increased uh, renewable energies here. So let's replay that. We went from 3.6 to 3.5. Okay, and so you can see renewable energies went up and oil and carbon uh, coal went down the most, all right, but we didn't get very far here. Um, let's see what, uh, uh, let's see, we want to do a $75 per ton carbon tax. Um, well, we're going to have to do these one at a time. We'll do a $75 carbon tax. We'll go under here and do $75 and see what impact that has. Okay, so watch the, watch the lines on the graph on the left. And you can see that that had a significant, so we got down to 3.0. Okay, okay, so let's replay that. Okay, so you can see gas, oil, and coal came down. Um, Bioenergy came down a little bit and renewable energies is up there because we've subsidized that. Okay, let's see, somebody suggested, did somebody suggest electrification? Let's, uh, let's electrify transport. Okay, so now we got it down, but we went from, 
Ooh, this is let, let's change this back to um, to the temperature graph. Let's see temperature. So we're down to 2.9 here from 3.0. So that the electrification. Um, so we've incentivized electrification. Let's see. Can um, can one of my uh, co-facilitators here give me some other uh, read some of the other um, options that people have suggested? Yeah, we had uh, transportation in general and or airplanes. Okay, so that's uh, so energy efficiency in those. Is that what you're thinking? Just more uh, getting rid of airplanes and uh, uh, electrification of transport, fifty percent. Okay, let's see electrification of transport. We've already done some electrification. Well, let's electric. Let's let's do some more electrification. Highly incentivized. That's brought it down. So it's brought it down significantly, but here the temperatures have only reduced down to 2.9 degrees C. Um, Another one is nuclear. Nuclear, that's a good one. Um, so we want to increase the use of nuclear energy. Yeah. It, it didn't change the temperatures at all, but you can see that light blue line went up a little bit and it changed the shape of the oil line. So things are changing slightly, but not, not significantly. Okay, what other suggestions do people have? Use of electric vehicles, renewables and electrification, transport electrification up 50%. Let's see what we have. We say transport here. All right, you want electric, you want to make this go up to 50%, and this, right now it's just 4.5%. 50%. Uh, well, we can't do 50%. Oh, oh, per year. So what we can do is we, we um, can do up to five, we'll do the maximum 5%. And then we'll do it, make it happen between 2100. Well, it, so it, this would go up over 10 years. Um, uh, to electrify transport accelerates starting right away. But it didn't it really didn't have much of effect here. You're already pretty high with 4.5%. Yeah, we were already pretty high with 4.5%. Okay. Um, How about buildings, uh, building and industry? Seems like there's some potential there. Okay, which one should we try first? Uh, energy efficiency. Just yeah, we'll do energy. So we did electrification here. We'll try energy efficiency here. We're highly increasing, um, and we got down from 2.9 to 2.7. So renewable energies is way up. Um, well, actually, renewable energies come. So this is another, uh, since uh, the NROADS model is a systems dynamics model, what that means is that lots of things can be impacted in different ways. And so by having energy, by increasing energy efficiency, it decreases the uh, demand for energy. And so that's why renewable energy comes down when you increase efficiency of buildings, as well as coal, oil, and gas coming down. And I think if we can go to energy demand. So you can see that the, like if I replay this, so this is the demand of renewable energy. And if I replay this, you'll see that it was higher and it is, it, it, and hmm, that's interesting. I'm not sure why this is going up, um, but it, but it is changing the shape, so it's impacting it. I'm not sure why for that. Okay. Couple other suggestions. Uh, yeah. One around uh, trees. Trees. Okay. Let's try to discourage deforestation. So we're going to highly reduce deforestation, and we've come down from 2.7 to 2.6. And if we replay that change, you can see it has almost no impact on the, oh, I, it, it's, it's replaying two of them now. Um, but the, the, the deforestation is not having a large impact on the uh, emissions of uh, uh, the global sources of primary energy. Um, Let's try something that's a little bit different. Let's try uh, technologically removing uh, gases from the atmosphere. 
increase that. And that got us down to 2.4. Okay, so we are going to stop there um, at this point, and we are going to have you, everybody here, play with the model and explore what you're going to do is I can share this particular this scenario. Uh, I can show you the link and I'm going to put that in the chat um, for this scenario so that everybody has it. And then we're going to go into um, breakout rooms. And in your breakout room, I want you to um, uh, have a discussion. You're going to pick two of two options of so two solutions that you would like to try. Um, you can test them in the model. And then um, I want you to identify a spokesperson who will, after we come back from the breakout rooms, will share their scenario, the scenario that your group has decided on. You'll get to offer in that round one solution. I want you to come up with your top two solutions. So in case somebody picks your solution first, you can choose another one. But I want you to go further than just the solution itself. I want you to consider go underneath and in where these three dots are and look at those um, uh, co-benefits. What are the co-benefits of that particular solution? And what are the, um, and I'll go back to show you exactly where that is. It's on here, you click on the I and you go down here to here's the co-benefits and the equity considerations. So if there are, how are the equity considerations going to be addressed? Okay, so, um, can you tell me how many people are here? We have 20 people. So I'm going to make um, four breakout rooms. Yeah, for, I'll, I'll make four breakout rooms. I hate to multitask here. There's a couple of questions you might want to answer before they go on the breakout. Okay. Uh, one is uh, with regards to the EV thing, are EVs versus E buses differentiated in the model? I do not think so. So when we talk about transport, it's all of transport. So electrification, let's go down to here. So investments is, so examples are investments into electrical charging uh, infrastructure, research and development into technological technologies for vehicles, batteries and charging, corporate commitments to sales of electric vehicles and programs to offer rebates and incentives for electric, um, electric car purchases. Um, let's see. So this is electrification of the entire transportation system altogether. Um, we can go to, I don't have the time now, but we can go into the En-ROAD site. That's, uh, I can put that URL in here and you can look at the details of what's actually included that. Um, you can no, look I'm at looking at, there's three more questions. They could be dealt with at the end, I think. So maybe you wanna go ahead and focus on the breakouts. Okay. I'll, I'll serve you up those questions later. All right, thank you, Tim. All right, so let's see, we're gonna do four breakout rooms. Um, where? Oh, here we go. Breakout rooms. Actually, I'll make five breakout. Uh, uh, well, we'll do we'll do five breakout rooms. Are you going to provide us the link before we go to breakout rooms, or are you going to send? It I did to already. Oh, I did it. Do you, do you see the link in the chat? Uh, no. No. All right. I will do it again. But I I I did share it. All right. Let's see. Copy link scenario. And. See if you sent it to everyone because it didn't show up for me. Okay. Um, oh, I can see. I see what happened. Okay, somebody sent me. All right. Thanks for mentioning that. Yep. We have okay. Does everybody have the link now? Yes, I think I think everyone should. I see it. Okay. So we're gonna go into five breakout rooms and. Um, you have about 20 minutes. Remember, you want to identify um, a, a, a spokesperson. One person can take the lead in sharing their screen and discuss and, and, and then implement and, and implement the different solutions that people suggest. Um, don't undo anything that we've done already. We're gonna build on what we've uh, created so far. 
All right, well, welcome back everybody. We're gonna now go around starting with, uh, with group one. So the spokesperson for group one, I want you to give your top solution, one solution, and um, it also talk about why you chose that solution and what are the co-benefits of that solution and what are the equity considerations of that solution? Okay, when you say one solution, you mean one lever or one solution? Yeah, that... one lever, one lever. Okay, well, I, I guess the one lever that um, we looked at was methane reduction. Okay. The assumption there is there would be. Well, what did you so tell me what it is you, you implemented, like on something underneath uh, or at this top level? Uh, we cut the methane re, uh, emissions by half. So. Oh, I have to do minus. Okay. So that goes down to 2.0 right there. Okay, go ahead with the uh, co-benefits and equity considerations. Well, the, the co-benefit is, um, well, the idea, one of the benefits that was there is a reduction in meat and a potential impact that had on health. Um, of course, you also have issues of um, not so much water or land use that you tend to see with uh, raising cattle, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what about the equity considerations? Are there problems with, with that kind of a change? I, I didn't get that far. <laughs> All right. Well, let's just take a quick look here. Equity considerations. There's cultural values with, associated with certain foods. Policies implemented without chemi threatens uh, food security and local economies and employment can be threatened. So those are the kind of equity considerations that would have to be considered. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Um, let's go on to uh, group two, breakout room two. Okay, guys, if it's okay with you, um, let me just summarize what we discussed and what we actually did. We discussed, um, and we kind of all were in agreement that carbon policy and the carbon price more aggressive than what was tried in 2019 and did not succeed in the US is important. So we decided to uh, put something that's at uh, $50 a ton in 2023 and $100 a ton by 2050. Okay, so we already, we had already, so I, how do you want me to make this change? Well, I don't know if you can increase it at a certain number or how, but we're basically thinking that 50 is the reasonable minimum and 100 is probably the reasonable maximum for by 2050, if you start around 2023 or so. All right, well, we already had $75 a ton was already in the model. So I'm gonna leave that, but we'll say the final carbon price is 100. 100, right. And the, the main benefit we felt from that, based on uh, the playing that you did with us originally, is that's going to push down the worst contributor to carbon and other pollution, which is coal in power generation. And therefore, the benefits are going to be less. PM 2.5 particulates, which are affecting primarily lung disease in terms of long-term care for anything from uh, lung cancer to asthma, COPD, et cetera, et cetera. Not only from PM 2.5 from coal, but we did not address this, but also PM 2.5 from burning diesel. Um, so that was the, the co-benefits, if you will, of lower healthcare costs long-term, especially in countries like China, which is a mm -hmm. big user of coal power generation, and to a lesser extent, India, and to a lesser extent, of course, the developed countries, which brought us to a very interesting discussion that we had of the haves and the have-nots, and how can you address this equity participation issue that you talked about, 
And one way we thought is the developed countries should upfront be paying a higher carbon price at this in the short term than the less developed countries. Mm -hmm. So if we're starting with 75, let's say, well, I don't know again if the model can handle this, but somehow you separate the two groups into a, um, developed countries being higher by at least $20 a ton or more than the emerging countries. And that would allow jobs and um, buying fuel in the emerging countries to be not punished as much as it right. would be in the developed countries. That's a very interesting way. We can't put that explicitly in the model, but it's a very interesting discussion about uh, how to address the equity issues. One, One thing way. I wanted to point out here is that we added that carbon price on. So we already had a pretty hard high carbon price at $75 per ton. And we just made it so that by 2100, it would be uh, $100 a ton. And it had no impact. I mean, I don't see any discernible move in, in uh, well, this is now going back to other things too, but um, when you so just will have to wait until it stops. Renewable. It didn't even impact nuclear when you showed it, which I was kind of surprised with the zero carbon footprint of nuclear, because that's the other discussion that we had, which was very good oh, in terms of in the lever of technology, adding things like the next generation of nuclear power generation, as opposed to what we have now with the uh, radioactive waste disposal problem mm -hmm. is number one. Number two, new technology being hydrogen. And number three being uh, CCUS, uh, I'm sorry, um, carbon sequestration and underground storage, um, more efficient and less costly. Yeah. Those three are the key technologies that would really take us to the next step. But we kind of thought that those were something around 2040, 2050 of, of actually happening, as opposed to in the shorter term, new technology would be battery storage, badly needed, especially for utility scale power generation. OK, well, thank you very much. We need to move on to our next group. Um, so we will ask group three, spokesperson for group three. Was that us? We'll read group three. OK, I think we probably. Oh, that's you. OK, good. OK, so can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, on behalf of uh, Group 3, so um, we actually had a ringer help us um, with this because we, 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 we found a few things that, that didn't work. So that was actually very educational. And, um, and, and then we looked at um, um, carbon removal. So um, that um, and increasing the amount of technological carbon removal uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, which turned so out to be over and above the medium growth we had before above the medium growth so if, if you increase that um it has a uh it has an impact yes and, it does um, yeah so it got, went from 2.0 to 1.9 right and, but, and if you look at the if whole you look scale, at it but if you look at the the line graphs you don't see too much movement there at all right Right, but you you see you see the um, well you don't see a huge amount of movement, but but this is this this graph's already I mean this scenario has already got a lot of mitigation effects that are right yeah well know. the other thing I want to point out is that by taking the carbon out of the air or that would not impact the primary sources of energy because this is just the inputs here we're taking it out so right. it doesn't it doesn't impact the inputs at all. It right. just is a matter of taking it out. So that's why you don't see any movement over here, but it does have an impact from 2.0 to 1.9. Yeah. So what were the co what are the co-benefits of this and the equity considerations? Uh, sure. So so I think you know, I think the reason you're not seeing a, an even bigger impact is because um, the hydrocarbon fuels have already been driven down a lot in this scenario. Um, but the the um, the co the co-benefits. Um, well, okay, so, 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 so I, I, I guess the um, uh, potential co-benefits, if you use nature-based carbon removal approaches, um, like agricultural uh, soil sequestration, 
um, you know, that, that could improve um, uh, economics uh, for farmers, um, you know, who may be able to uh, um, gain some economic, um, you know, benefit from, from selling those rights or how, however that's done. And, um, and, and, and there'd be a lot of new businesses and industries, you know, that, that would arise uh, from, from such a thing. Okay. Thank can you. I ask a question? Can I ask a question, please, for this uh, for the technological carbon storage? Does the CCUS to be viable commercially is now asking for something around seventy-five to eighty dollars a ton carbon price subsidy? Is that connected in the model when you're looking at the carbon storage versus the carbon price, or not? So I state that again. Uh, today, to have a commercially viable CCUS project, underground storage and capture project, the promoters are looking for at least something between seventy and eighty-five dollars a ton subsidy or carbon price, if you want to call it that, because then they say their economics are viable and they can grow a lot faster. So when you're looking, when you're changing that valve on, on CCUS technology, is it assuming at the same time that in order for you to do that increase in more capacity for carbon storage, you're assuming a very aggressive carbon price or carbon tax? Or I'd not? have to ask that question. I don't know the answer. Okay. All right. But I will ask it and I will send the answer to uh, Monica and then she could uh, send it to everybody who participated. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on to group four. Hi, I was in group four and I'm gonna say that we have, we were all very novice. We learned quite a lot. I learned lots of terminology and things to explore. And we just thought, well, just, just increase the new uh, renewable and uh, squash all the fossils, which you have done already. But it was an eye opening for me to see some of the other results, like just doing the methane and the technology says, oh, wow, those actually are quite useful. And it really points it to me that I need to go and maybe some of the other people in my group needs to learn more about all the different aspects. And this is one way of seeing all the different options and ups and downs and the details. So we definitely did not go into the, the benefits or the good things. Okay. But it was you, kind of fun. Thank okay, you very great. Much did, for did, you have, did, you have a, did you have a favorite solution you want to try to implement here? Well, as I said, you know, more new renewables and squash, you know, FOCO and more renewables. Increase, yeah. And then the, uh, the fossil fuels, the coal, oil, but, you know, the, the usual what you've done in the beginning, in a sense. All right. Well, putting a, well, let's see if that putting a tax on coal at this point has much of an impact. Well, not much of an impact on temperature. It moves this brown line down a bit, but all of these out years when it's already pretty low. So right. it doesn't really Actually, do anything. Why don't you pick one of the coal, the oil or the, when you, you said oil and coal were ones you played with, right? Yes. So why don't you talk right, about the oil back. We'll choice? We'll use coal here and we'll just, and we'll just do oil. All right, well, that actually had more of an impact because that was still higher so that it came down, so they, they, the red line came down some. So actually that one had more of an impact at this point. Right. It, it came down from 1.9 to 1.8. Can you put it down? Can you do it like another half of that? <laughs> okay, still 1.8. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's go to, we have one left, right, T group five? Steve, do you want to cover it or should I? Where'd you go? There you are, Steve, you're still muted. He's pointing at me, I guess. <laughs> we did, we played with the uh, fossil fuels. We, we figured out how to get the fossil fuels out of the picture. Um, and both natural gas and oil were good. We didn't, we're not suggesting that right now because we tried one other thing that did work fairly well. If we can get the population growth uh, to minimum, um, it, that made a big difference all the way down. All the way down. 
Yep. There it goes. And that was the co-benefits are, um, you know, the other systems are not as burdened um, and the equity issues have to do with educating women and, and, and girls and um, making sure that the, um, the, the process of ensuring that we only have 9.2 billion people on earth in 2100 um, is not a matter of forced sterilization or, or that kind of stuff. So, so that was interesting because that moved, that moved our temperature as much as um, changing oil and coal from where we had started. Oh, great, yeah. No, so, so you're, you're right to mention that, that uh, lower population growth doesn't mean sterilization. We're educating girls and women, it's been shown that if you educate in, in, in developing countries, if you educate women and girls, they go from having eight and nine babies to having two or three. So um, uh, that's, that is where the uh, population growth gets uh, cut significantly. Is the population right. growth re decrease uh, indicate a energy demand decrease? Yes, yes that would does. be true so too. So if you look at this, um, you can see even renewables goes down because the, this is the uh, global sources of primary energy. And I think that's, that's the energy demand. Total primary energy. So if we play this, you'll see. So yep, it, by having a lower population growth, you have energy demand goes down right. here. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the slides now. We're getting close to the end. All right, where do we put it? Did we get down to in that in that scenario? And can you we send us We got down the, to 1.7, we did really well. And if you would send us the, um, the link for that, that'd be good. Yeah, sure, I can do that right now. Thank you. Okay, where's the chat? Okay, did everybody get the link? We're looking right now. We got it. Thank you. Okay, I'll give you that. All right. Also, can you tell us a little bit about how we learn how to run this model better? I understand there's courses for it. Can you say that a little louder? I understand there's courses for us to learn better how right. to- Right, yeah, so learn. here, I can actually show you that. Oh, let me go to Edward's here. So this is the main page and uh, you can go to the training plan and then there's videos here to show you how to, how to use it. So there, there's the workshop, which we've just, we've just done. Um, there's a whole series, of, watch the recording. So this is the webinar series. Um, and so all, everything is free um, and you can, so here's the first one, which shows you how to engage people with the simulation. This is the workshop, which we did. There's also a climate action simulation game where you put, uh, you divide, instead of just in the breakout rooms we have, you put people into different sectors, um, the conventional energy sector, the renewable energy sector, the uh, world governments, um, the climate hawks, buildings and industry, um, and, and I think land use and uh, agriculture and land use. And then instead of you coming up with your two top scenarios, each group um, negotiates what they are going to, and they offer one solution, but they, in addition to offering a solution, they could also take away a solution. So if the climate hawks put this huge tax on carbon, conventional energy could take it off, but then collectively, they're supposed to negotiate getting down to 2.0 degrees. So that's the simula climate action simulation. And then this, uh, this one talks about the, the simulator dynamics, the social, social um, the, the system dynamic aspect of the, of the model. And there's two webinars on that. Um, and then the multi-solving, which really deal, which deals with those co-benefits and those equity issues. And then just more information about facilitating um, and, uh, and, and building confidence in running the model. So those are the online webinars. There is also a recording um, from the December 3rd um, uh, webinar where they described all of the new uh, changes to the model. That's so cool. that's where that is. 
and and you've sent we have that link right so you sent it to yeah us so it's it's enroads dot and i can put it in again one last question i teach energy policy is it possible to use this in a classroom say that again i teach energy policy at university can i use absolutely this? can i use it in the classroom absolutely great Thank you. Um, I, uh, I teach global climate change to undergraduate business students. And I use both this, uh, I actually will be doing this on Friday with that group. Um, we've already done a world climate simulation using the Sea roads model, which yeah. um, I, will, I won't get into now, um, yeah. but uh, is also on the Climate Interactive site. Okay. Do I have to sign any papers or anything for using it in the classroom or it's just nope. go ahead? Okay. Nope. Thank you. What, what, what they do want you to do, if you do use it in your class, there is a place to register it. And that, uh, that graph that I showed you at the beginning, let's see, let me go back. Uh, let's just see. Things are moving a little slow here. Um, so, uh, so here all the way towards the bottom, and I will be doing this for our, so there's the map for as of today. Okay. So, um, and then you can register your event and I will go in and register. So they wanna know, they want you to register it so that you tell them who you registered, who you ran it with and how many people so that they can add to this list and they can justify the funding that their funders give them for developing the model. Sure. So, so it's important to do that. Even if you're not an ambassador, if you run an event, you should, uh, you should do it. The other piece, if you want to use it for a class, there also is an, a, sh a short assignment. And I had considered using that in my class with, um, in which the students work with the model themselves. Uh, they watch a 20 minute video about how the model works and then they use the model themselves, but they get much more into the co-benefits and the equity issues um, as well as the solutions themselves. So it's another, it's another tool you can use in a class. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so um, we don't have a whole lot of time here. We are, it is actually at eight o'clock now. So I'm going to skip that part. Um, See, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll just finish. Well, I'll finish with this. Uh, <laughs> since we are at eight o'clock. Um, so uh, thank you very much. You can, um, as we just discussed, you can play with the model further. You can use it in all different kinds of venues. I actually gave a GK is on this. I gave, I, uh, we did a 45 minute version of this in his classes. Uh, with a much smaller group. So GK, we didn't have breakout rooms in your classes because you're, you're, we only had 45 minutes. Um, and, um, and I've used it with, a, with a multiple groups of teachers. I've had up to 70 teachers um, um, on a, a workshop and I am working towards doing um, a full simulation with the three hour negotiation simulation with Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland with the teachers and hopefully with some students, I'll be doing it, I'll hopefully be doing it twice, once with a group of teachers and then once with a group of teachers and students. Um, I have used it with uh, Tim Connors is on the call. I did it with an alumni group from his, uh, his uh, youth leadership uh, program. Um, so it can be used in all different kinds of venues. The MACA group, um, uh, which is uh, which I'm part of the MIT Alumni for Climate Action Group. Um, we have a, a, a significant group of us are engaged with trying to convince policymakers to support laws that will address some of these solutions. And uh, the, this model has been used by Climate Interactive to convince policymakers of what are the high leverage solutions. Um, so those are various other ways that um, it can be used and engage with a vast variety of different groups. It has also at that high level without going under, you know, in with those three dots to all that detail, you can use this with middle school students. Um, they can really get a sense because giving them an understanding of the, um, the systems dynamic aspect of it is that 
once you have multiple solutions involved, each individual one that you add on top of it has a, a smaller impact um, because a lot of things have been taken care of already. Um, and that's a really hard concept to get across to students. So um, being able to address that, but in, in order to do that, you really do need to um, work through those webinars. The other thing which I've completed and some of the other members of MACA have completed is to become climate ambassadors. And it involves watching all of those um, videos and then in engaging in some other activities, running some workshops um, and, and those kinds of things to become a climate ambassador. Um, and so uh, that really helps you understand how to use the model. The model came out exactly a year ago, just as I was finishing my semester with my class um, uh, last fall. And it was the very last class and the model came out and I was so excited about it. And I tried to show it to them but I had no idea how to use it. <laughs> and so I took the whole next semester, the rest of the next semester to learn how to use it, become a climate ambassador. And at the end of spring semester, I ran two workshops. My first two workshops were last April with my classes. I had two classes um, in which I ran this. Um, and the students do find it really, really um, helpful. And just as you did in, in, in looking at that systems dynamics aspect, and one of the big takeaways from this is there's no silver bullet. There's no one solution that's gonna get us there. It takes the entire world and it basically is silver buckshot. Lots of different solutions implemented in different ways. And, as you can probably guess, most of these solutions weren't as effective in some places as they are in other places. So the kinds of things that you implement um, may, be, may differ from place to place. While this model makes the assumption that everybody in the world is making all of these solutions. So that's another, um, uh, another thing to think about. That is Fabulous, Tamara. Thank you so much. I can hear a round of applause going on in, in the rest <laughs> of this uh, audience, all these muted people. I, that was a great hello, GK. I just wanted to mention that um, I am coordinator of the MIT Alumni Energy Environment and Sustainability Network. I hope most of you have been getting our newsletters and, and announcements. We do monthly webinars. Uh, it's, a, it's a broader uh, set of topics. It's, it's a lot of it education, much as Tamara has, has, has done with this and much as MACA is doing as an action about rolling out these webinars so that people understand uh, what it's going to take better. I mean, that's really excellent. MACA, um, the, the particular group that, that Tamara's in, uh, the point of the network is to get the groups together so that we all can share. The point of the network is to connect alums because um, when you take one alum, and you add another alum, you get results that are way more than double. I mean, we're analytical people who believe in science. And so that's what the uh, EESN is about. I had put the, um, um, the, the web, web URL in the chat there. Uh, I hope you can also, we, we just want to uh, share information among all the alums. Any alumni group, say it was researchers doing water cycle. We, we wanna help support and enable them and empower them to get together and to see what kinds of things we can work on together. So you should be aware that that's been around about 10 years and MACA popped up as an action group under our network um, about uh, three years ago. And it's really excellent because action is really what we want. It's not just education, we, we can do so much more. And I really appreciate that the South Asian Alumni Association has, um, has, has, has put this uh, webinar on and, and we, we uh, certainly uh, are hoping that uh, Tamara and Tim and the MACA group and the rest of the clubs around the world, et cetera, will put on many more throughout the year. We will be um, putting it on our website. As a matter of fact, um, Tamara's Mac, Tamara and Tim's MACA group, uh, which uh, group B or, or Climate Solutions, will be appearing on the EESN website to the extent that we can do, uh, that we can put it up there. So that, that will be a place to at least check for some events that are going on that maybe don't specifically address climate, maybe they're just clean energy, you know, just the, the pieces that go together that we now know as, as climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was fantastic. And I'll definitely be in touch with uh, both of you. So thank okay. you. Again.
Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great Thank you. Very interesting. Stay safe. Hey, Tamara, real quick, uh, yeah. uh, I, I, there's another meeting going on here with a local Minnesota group that uh, may uh, leverage the en roads thing here. It's so okay. <laughs> really pretty quick, but uh, this seemed to go really well. Um, it although I, it, does, it does seem like uh, even with this size group, uh, you know, having someone to read through the chat and stuff it would be of some benefit. Um, yeah, it, it is somewhat helpful because when you share your, it, it's, it keeps moving where the chat is, you know, depending on if you're sharing your screen or not. Right. So it's a little bit of a challenge and it's hard when I'm answering a question to then scroll and read other questions at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. Even with the monthly webinars, just getting questions in is like, you know, there has to be somebody monitoring it. What do you find is the best size of a breakout group? the two of you that you've used so i so i can so i think having 30 people and six breakout groups, having five people in a breakout group i think is the best number um, five yeah i, I think five. that's a that's probably good because Tim, i don't know enough, have you had other it gives experience? enough perspectives um and it's still small enough that everybody feels like they need to speak up yeah i um, think i think five's a number six you're starting to push too high and four right you know, now I've run some, but then so the so I've I've thought about this a lot because I had when I did the teacher group there were sixty eight teachers in the group and what I opted to do um, was to keep it to six breakout groups that made the breakout groups bigger, but when you come to the end and you have to have a report out from each group if you make more breakout groups it takes longer to get through the report outs and you generally don't have that time. Um, so, uh, so I think six, we cut it down because there was only 20 here. I cut it down to five. Um, I except we had three. To, huh? you, yeah. <laughs> except we had three. There were no, three. Down, one of the things. Go ahead. There were three alumni association people on board. So you have to remember to take them out of the, the count when you're, when you're looking at smaller numbers. Yeah. The point similar to the one I was in. Tamara, you know, Michael and I were there. Right. I, maybe I should have made it four, only four groups, because uh, that would have put four to five in a group. Or you could even went one less, most likely, because based on our, our constituency tonight, uh, a bunch of us didn't really have to participate. We were, we were just... Right, kind of yeah. But, hey, you know... Whatever. And then there was at one point where I thought of moving you, Tim, but you were, we were already like halfway through... The breakouts, yeah. and I thought that it would have been a bit disruptive to take you out of the conversation that you had yeah. been in. The the one other thing you can do with the event invitations, the way they're set up by the alumni association, is you can put a little survey in there. You can ask people either what their background is, or how much they're aware of climate policy, or whether they know a lot about. Um, energy and, and um, decarbonizing energy. I mean, there, there, if, you, if you had a set of questions that would help you mix people better into the groups or, or the well, groups the totally random. Well, you have to do it on the fly. I mean, 45 okay. people signed up for this and only 20 people showed up. No, of so, course they do, yeah. And, and so if, unless, I mean, so it works in my class because I had my, my class on teams, on six teams from the third week of the semester. So everybody, so, everybody's set and they know who everybody is in their group. But when you don't know who's gonna show up until they show up, it's hard to take those things into consideration. Well, the other thing is not everybody's gonna answer the survey. So, you know, mm -hmm. it just, and, and it is, you're right. It's about 50% participation when you, when you have these Zoom things mm -hmm. and uh, generally, I mean, just right. as a, you know, just as a crazy. And um, what you can do is, especially if you have somebody helping you, you can see whether uh, the, the groups that you had looked at, are, the people are actually there, how many people are actually. Okay. Well, the other thing we could have done is I could have had, so when we had, we had a test, uh, we had a, a I should, uh, I'm, Tim I'm has to, to go. Yeah, okay. I, I'm trying to sell en roads to a group here, so. <laughs> okay, go ahead. But uh, uh, Sarah, um, Let's see, uh, marketing the MIT Club of Minnesota. I think I've got that in 
to work. So we'll maybe talk about that tomorrow. Um, sure. Do you want to do that outside the? Uh, yes, yes, we should do that. We can, we can do that. Um, that's fine. I'll do it on email. That's fine. Okay. And, and, and you know, whatever you market, whoever you get, it's great. Just let me know the date and the, yeah. and we'll see what I can do to help. Um, I, I didn't. Go ahead. I don't know if anybody's willing to um, put the time in to figure out how to reach outside the club, but they're willing to reach outside the club. So um, I'll need some help understanding if, if they say, yeah, we're fine with other people coming in. How does that work? I don't know what the process is. Well, it's pretty easy. The public, the registrations are can be public for okay. anything that we that we publish. Okay. Um, and Tamara, good. So if you have another couple minutes, Tamara, I would I would. Sure. Uh, yeah. All right. Good. See you guys. Okay, Catch bye. up with you tomorrow. Bye bye. What was I going to say? And Dan Carnese is still here. He may, maybe he's an maybe he's an alumni association person, or do you know him? I have no idea who he is. I mean, I find <laughs> that some people forget to log off when they leave. Although, if we if they knew we were talking, they had to leave the meeting open. So, um, you know, just whatever the alumni association. But they're not. They're. This was yours. Not one this... of the people from the alumni association. What they might have done. I have the ability to. I mean, see what they. Oh, they made me the host. That's okay. why. That's so fine. I could do the okay. breakout rooms. They made me the host. So that's why. Okay. Okay. That's great. Um, no, this was excellent. This was really good. I have a, I don't know if she calls herself an ambassador here in town who was, who was trying to show it to our local um, uh, board of selectmen and the town managers and stuff. And of course, so who came all the environmental people from the community. <laughs> and I don't know, I, I, I was supposed to do it with her and I forgot, I completely forgot, which was really stupid. Um, but um, I have no idea how it actually went, but I'm really delighted to see this. I know that Kirki Kufiani and the people in Europe were very interested in having you, because Kirki was just uh, beside herself. Somebody brought one of these presentations to Shell. Somebody who works in Shell. Do you happen, you know, if they, and it was it was terrible. They didn't know that En-ROAD stood for something, was initials for something. Um, and she was just totally embarrassed because she had played a little bit with the, um, um with the training and all and she she knew more about this model than this person who was and, and here they had gotten inside of shell oil to do a presentation mm. and people were interested and, and and that's that's really um you're here in boston i'm here in boston you know in boston mit mm -hmm. is not a very big you know it's it's big but it's you know mm -hmm. uh but outside this area um and outside the mit community the MIT name is huge. The people in Europe want to hear from MIT alums, that kind of thing. The people in the West Coast often don't hear from, from them. Oh, I know, I specifically wanted to ask you, um, <laughs> when you put your title on there, Interactive Climate, um, Ramon Bueno, uh, who's doing our webinars um, with me is, um, he said, they've got the name switched, you know, because it's climate interactive and then you had interactive climate. So, um, it confused him. I call him. it Climate Interactive. Where do I have it say Interactive Climate? Interactive Climate Workshop is the way your title reads, or the way that they put it on the South Asian website. Well, then they, yeah, but I would not have done that. So I, but I, 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 I'll so make that, sure I look at it next time. More the, I put stuff on the EESN website that um, was my interpretation of what might draw people better. I don't know if it will. I don't know if it did. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody could go see it because sometimes it ends up behind a sign-in thing. But if you, if we could come up with a package for promoting it, that'd be really good. What you sent me of uh, that time for my front page was about twice as many words as really fit there well. So I had okay. to cut it down. Mm -hmm. On this, on the description page for the event, you can go on. And I love the, the graphics you know, of the dashboard and they're just mm -hmm. colorful. They're really attractive. And so mm -hmm. on the description page that's associated with the EESN group, um, the, I, I, I think I pulled out one of the, one of the graphics. I, I helped my friend Carolyn with that because again, you know, it just, this dashboard's very complicated. This dashboard is not obvious what it is as, as you heard people say, and as you know, you know, it just, you got to get down into the, into the, Right. into the weeds to find the innovative, you know, things. And I'm very glad they've changed it because the innovative um, 
lever and the energy side used to only be um, nuclear innovation, pretty much. Well, so, there was this, this one down here, the new zero carbon was said new tech. Yeah. It wasn't nuclear, but it didn't have any more. So they changed it, but now people didn't know where new tech was. Exactly, exactly. And I love your slides. If I can use them and, and share them with friends who are, are um, trainers. Do you happen to know David Miller? He's another ambassador. He actually uh, yeah. does some, he, he does some mentoring over at Sloan too. Um, okay, no, I don't know. He did a workshop with us. I don't know. Yeah, it must have been recorded because Jason came to um, do it with him. We mm -hmm. had about 40 people. It was a group called Environmental Entrepreneurs. We're known as E2. And we had two state representatives there. Mm -hmm. And we never followed up on it. One of them only had an hour to sit with us. Um, but we may be two or, or whoever be able to get back to Beacon Hill, you know, back to the state. This mobilization thing is great. If, if, if people in the different clubs are excited about it, it would be a good way to help mobilize people for talking mm -hmm. to the elected officials, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is, I'm sure Tim's talked to you about that. It's really- Oh yeah, no, that's part of group B. So yeah, I'm hearing about that all the time. Yeah, and I think you might as well have a, your own name and we'll, because the th point of the network is not to have a, you know, a pyramid structure. It's to mm -hmm. have very flexible groups of whoever wants to go off and do something and let's advertise it and see if we can get more people. The power is yeah. in the, in the working together. Okay, well, if you want me to um, revise, I mean, you can send me whatever the short blurb is and whatever the longer one is, and I can, and I can revise it in, uh, and make it better in, t in terms of any, you know, just just tell me what parameters that it needs to fit into, and I can work on it. That's fine. That's great. Um, have you been to our website? I think so, but I haven't studied it, so I can't remember. <laughs> no, you don't have to study it. <laughs> no, it just the other thing is. Um, we are we we have a education purpose. You know, we want to have a library of resources um, section of the website, and we want the MACA group and the other groups to use the website as a place to put information and resources. So, if there were a packet of um, you know the best webinars, the best um, training to do, um, the best slides you have. Um, um, for example, so my slide, these slides came from Climate Interactive. I, I customized them to the way I wanted to give the talk. Um, and so you'll actually see, I think there's 60 some slides and a lot of them are appendix, you know, sort of like if somebody asks a question then I know it's there. But what I end up finding is that we get to the end of the thing and I'm hardly able to get to the end of the slides that I have. I know, how do you feel now? More hopeful? I know, you're supposed to say that. You're supposed, to, just... you're supposed to do the one minute of sign. This is the first time I've not been able to do that at all. Um, <laughs> but the, people kept asking me other questions that were not really related exactly to the workshop itself, but to the things around it. But I, I wanted to be able to, to help them be able to do it for others. So that was just all good. Well, maybe we should pair it as a two-part thing where we first talk about climate issues and climate policies. The carbon fee people are just, you know, the, the Citizens Climate Lobby and Climate Exchange are just so enthusiastic about carbon fee. Mm -hmm. But but politically, we've never been able to do it in the United States. So, mm -hmm. you know, if we get it, we, we have done it on sectors. East Coast, as you know, has done a carbon price on electricity pollution, the REGI program. We're trying to get the transportation program to have a carbon price on its fuel. And so what that will leave is building building fuels and industry. So we will have two thirds of the uses of carbon fuels covered for prices already. If if the TCI goes through. Are you aware of TCI? Do you have you no, been looking at that think. at all? What does TCI stand for? Transportation and Climate Initiative. Let me send you some stuff on it because they, they they've the, the state agencies are working on it. Just they were able to do the whole uh, energy price, uh, pollution price thing about 10 years ago. So they've tried to model this transportation and climate initiative and the, the, the um, deniers grab hold of it and they say, oh, it's a carbon tax. It's, it's just gonna make your gas prices go up. And it's, it's a fee on the distributors. So it will probably be passed down, but it will also help people go to electric vehicles, I think. Mm -hmm. um, plus the revenue from the auctions 
is going to be used for all kinds of things like transit, whatever the state decides is needed, equity issues, um, we, charging networks, you know, up and down the East Coast, mm -hmm. if that's what's needed and the market doesn't take care of it. So um, incidentally, the guy who was on today with me, Stephen Rudnick. Yeah. Have you ever heard that name? Do you know him? It sounds vaguely familiar, but not really. He was the, the person who ran the environmental sciences group at UMass. And um, he was the faculty, he was the professor and um, he's an oceanographer apparently. So um, I was pleased to see that. I just, you know, that's one of the things I love about EESN is finding out about all the people in the environmental business and the environmental <laughs> issues and meteorology. Mm -hmm. I was an air pollution person. So meteorology is near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, Bruce Mallet, the air director, when I worked for him saying, boy, if people were dropping in the street from health effects, you know, maybe then they'd pay attention to air pollution and pay and support us, you know, it just, and, and for, for the whole um, environmental movement to come back to health effects of these things is just, I mean, when you increase coal, I mean, if you decrease coal already in the United States is clean, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, the, it's collecting the 2.5, you know, it's collecting most of the small emissions and it's not, the big power plants are not affecting urban dwellers you know it's the gas stoves in their houses and the cars driving by the streets it's although diesel as the guy said is a good and and the other thing is this is this is a group of mit alumni so yeah you know any yeah, of these yeah, clubs they, they want to make everything more complex and i know the model doesn't doesn't enable that <laughs> and that um, that you know maybe that's even something that that um you, you'd be able to build in you know is this audience is going to be well, when I They're did already... the MACA group, I, I had offered to run a workshop for the MACA group and then realized what the questions they were going to ask. I actually asked Drew Jones, who is co-founder yes, and yes, co director yes, yes. And I had him and he didn't actually run a workshop, but he, he was able, he knows the insides and outs of the model. model and he could answer those questions. So I'm sure, I mean, we did that in July. I'm sure if there was a totally new group of MIT alums I mean, he said right away he would do it. So um, he would be much more because I, I do know that I do not know the depths of this model. Um, I've gotten deeper than a lot of people have, but uh, I, I can't, I mean, I know how I could go and find out all of those basic assumptions and the basic equations that they're using. I know that it's there, but I don't have it all in my head and I can't figure that out during the course of an hour and a half workshop. No, you're exactly right. And and I was there, must have been, I guess it was a year and a half ago when they ran a beta uh, workshop at MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, Drew was there and the woman from U Lowell. Juliet um, Rooney Varga. Yes, Juliet. I know her very well. I've known her for years. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. That's great. No, that's really great. So actually, so maybe that's just the thing you say is there's a lot of information about the model and how, how a, a complex dynamic systems dynamic model works on the website. We're not going to go into those details and I can't give you the exact assumptions in this workshop. You know, we're going to try and um, uh, focus it on where the rubber hits the road, which is mm -hmm. getting people to make these changes, whether it's right. tax policy or, uh, you know, the markets that are changing to be electric vehicles, that kind of thing. So. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I'm going to have that's... to go, but I, I did want to tell you that I do have, I created a Google Doc with lots of resources for my students in my class. Ooh. And I also led a project called the Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network, which, uh, so that's clean. And uh, if you go to cleannet.org, there is a collection, a reviewed collection of resources around climate change. No, that's excellent. I mean, how do you spell clean? C-L-E-A-N. Clean or so, so the so so the web's here. I'll just put it in the chat here. Um, oh, clean net. Oh, clean net. Okay, okay. Clean. Clean net. Dot org. Great. Now, do you happen to know we also have, and she spoke at our, and it's recorded our our January webinar. I know you have to go. I'm sorry, Emily Moberg. Uh, runs an organization called the National Climate, no, National 
network of ocean and Nachi. And it's it's called Noki. Climate Interpreter. Yes. Noki. Yes. Yes. I was on the yes. advisory board of that project. Excellent. And that and she has Aquarium. she has spoken for us. Um, okay. And she's an alum. So and, and the only thing about EESN is that we feature alums and we want to put them together. I have mm -hmm. no problem with having other people here, you know, having other people help organize, do joint programs with anybody else you want to, you know, the university that's local to wherever they are, University of Minnesota. That is great. That is absolutely super. I just want to let people know what alums are doing relative to the three topics and the, the merger right. of them, which is climate. So that's great. Yes, Emily, Emily's. So you know Emily or you just knew? Uh, no, the... I don't know Emily. I know Billy Spencer, who was the PI of the Noki project, and he asked me to be, I was I was on the um, uh, advisory board for that project during the time that it was funded. That is great. That's really super. You've you've been busy, lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we're gonna try it. I mean, I've been running the website, so I'm gonna try and get more resources or just send people over to your resources. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, what's the if you don't mind? And that that's what I did with Shill. Shill mm -hmm. was so intrigued with the idea that we had a voice and we could talk to our elected officials. He just he's still completely oh, um, I know. that. <laughs> I don't have to go further. I've been, yeah, Andrea has been working have, with me. We so. have uh, uh, the Maccabee group, uh, which is where that effort happens. Also, we have a meeting every other week. And Chill is there every other week? I think he is there almost every single time. And then we have it on top of that, the full Maka group meets once a month. So, oh, so you guys, yeah. you guys are good. I love it. I love it. Micah Gronin, if he's back working with you. He was the original co-chair with Shill, and he he really had a much uh, more better view as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Shill's a, a university professor. He's used to doing his own thing, having his yeah. own, you know. So anyway, good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. I'll send you. You can send me whatever links you were you were talking about, and I'll uh, return with the links to the various pieces that I can offer. Thank you. I will get that to you. Bye. Okay. Thanks a lot. Good night. Bye. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.